Father in heaven, what a wonderful privilege it is to come into your presence. We thank you for your holy word, which is a sure compass in a world of confusion and rebellion. And as we study today about sowing a character and reaping a destiny, we ask that your Holy Spirit will be here to teach us. We thank you for hearing our prayer. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. During the course of this seminar, we have been studying primarily the meaning of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And I would like to refresh our memory about that verse which is foundational to all of Scripture. In that verse, God is speaking to the serpent. And Adam and Eve are standing there and listening. And God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. One thing is very, very clear in this verse. And that is that there are only two groups that exist in this world from the beginning till the end of time. Only two seeds. The seed of the righteous and the seed of the wicked. Now in our study today we're going to notice that in the group which is classified as the wicked there are three different kinds of people. Whereas on God's side, there is only one type of person. So in the category of Satan's seed are three types of people. Whereas on the side of God's seed, there is only one type. Now we're going to study today the famous parable of Jesus of the sower who sowed the seed. And as we begin, I would like to say that this parable is found in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. What I mean by the Synoptic Gospels is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This parable is found in all three of these Gospels. Which means that we're not going to remain only in one Gospel as we study this parable. We're going to go to Matthew, Mark, and Luke in order to glean details from every single one of these uh, Gospels. And as I'm speaking now, I would like to ask the deacons to please distribute the list of texts. It almost skipped my mind. We have lists of texts and we would like the deacons at this point to please quickly distribute these lists of texts. We want to begin by looking at Matthew chapter 13 and verse 37. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 37. We want to determine first of all who the sower of the seed is. It says there in Matthew 13 and verse 37 the following. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. So in the parable of the sower, the person who sows the good seed is none less than Jesus. Now we also want to determine what the seed represents. Go with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 18, actually Luke chapter 8, not 18, Luke chapter 8 and verse 11. Luke chapter 8 and verse 11. It says here, now the parable is this, the seed is the Word of God. So notice that we have one sower, Jesus. We have only one seed, which is the Word of God. Now I want you to notice that that seed, that Word of God, is very, very powerful. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 55 and verses 10 and 11. Isaiah 55 and verses 10 and 11. Here we find the prophet speaking the following words. 
Isaiah chapter 55 and verses 10 and 11. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Here God promises that when He sows His seed His seed will bear fruit. His seed is powerful. His word is powerful. So what do we have so far? We have a sower who is Jesus. We have a seed which is the Word of God. And that seed is powerful to produce the results for which God sent it. But in this parable we also have four different soils. Four different grounds so to speak. Now the question is what do these four soils represent? Go with me to the Gospel of Mark chapter 4 and verse 15. Mark chapter 4 and verse 15. Here we have an explanation of what is meant by the soils. It says here the following, and this is speaking about the seed that fell by the wayside, but it will give us the principle for all of the soils. It says in verse 15, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown where? That was sown in their hearts. So the seed is sown in the ground or in the soil but the soil represents what? The soil represents the heart. And so in this parable of the sower you have four different kinds of hearts. Three of these hearts are not desirable. Only one of them is desirable. In fact three of these hearts end up being in the camp of Satan. And only one of these ends up being on the side of God. And so summarizing what we've studied, we have in this parable one sower who is Jesus. We have one seed which is the Word of God. The Word of God is powerful to accomplish the, the purpose for which it is sent and finally the soils represent four different kinds of hearts upon which the seed of the truth of God's Word falls. Now let's examine all four of these soils and see what they have to teach us today. Let's go first of all to the seed that fell by the wayside or on the path. Go with me to Luke chapter 8 and we'll read verse 12. Luke chapter 8 and verse 12. The seed by the wayside. It says here, those by the wayside are the ones who hear. By the way everyone in this parable hears. Those who, seeds that are planted by the wayside, the hearts hear. Those in stony places, the people hear. Those among thorns, the people hear. Those on good ground, the people hear. In other words, there is no way of saying, I didn't know this. In other words, everyone is responsible because every one of these soils hears the Word of God. Now notice once again, it says in verse 12, those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts lest they should believe and be what? And be saved. The seed that falls on the wayside or on the path does not even begin to germinate. The moment the seed falls on the heart the devil comes and takes away the seed. These are individuals who hear the word of God and immediately they reject the word or they postpone. They refuse to accept what God is teaching them. 
We have biblical examples of this type of person. You remember for example when the Apostle Paul appeared before Felix. The story is found in Acts chapter 24 and verse 25. The Apostle Paul preached this tremendous powerful sermon. And after he preached the sermon he was hoping that Felix would accept the message. But I want you to notice what happened with Felix. It says here in the book of Acts chapter 24 and verse 25 the following. Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Notice Paul's sermon. He's preaching the word of God about these things. Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time I will call for you. Do you know the opportunity never came? Because that was his moment of opportunity when he said, it's convenient, I will call you. No convenient time ever came. We have also the Apostle Paul standing before King Agrippa. Notice Acts chapter 26 and verses 27 and 28. Acts chapter 26 and verses 27 and 28. Once again the Apostle Paul has preached a powerful sermon about receiving Jesus Christ and preparing for the judgment. And I want you to notice what happens when he finishes his sermon. It says there in Acts chapter 26 and verse 27 and 28, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Sad tragic words. So Paul preached these powerful sermons before Felix, before Agrippa. Felix says, I will call you at a convenient season. He puts it off. Agrippa says, you know what you're saying is very persuasive and powerful. You almost persuade me to become a Christian, but not quite. The seed fell on the path. The seed fell by the wayside. It did not even begin to germinate in the heart. These types of hearers are also illustrated by those who stoned Stephen, the first Christian martyr. Go with me to the book of Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. By the way, this whole chapter almost is a sermon presented by Stephen to the Jewish Sanhedrin, to the Jewish council. And I want you to notice what happens after the sermon is preached. Chapter 7 and starting with verse 54. It says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. They were really angry, weren't they? But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said look I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God then they cried out with a loud voice stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord and they cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul gnashing their teeth, their hearts raging within them, rejecting this wonderful sermon that Stephen had preached beginning way back in the Old Testament and showing how prophecy was fulfilled and eventually the Messiah came. They openly rejected the message that God presented through Stephen. By the way in the end time there are going to be people like this also. In fact, all of those who receive the message of the Antichrist will eventually be people of this type. Notice 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I would like to read a few verses that we find there beginning with verse 8. It says there, and then the lawless one will be revealed. That's the Antichrist by the way whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. 
The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. And now notice why they perish. Because they did not receive what? The love of the truth that they might be saved. And by the way, what is truth? Jesus said in John 17 verse 17, Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. So what is rejected if they did not receive the love of the truth? They rejected truth which is found where? In the Holy Bible. And notice what we find in verse 11. And for this reason God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe what? The lie. That they all may be condemned who did not believe what? The truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. It is a serious thing to have the Word of God preached and presented to you. And the first type of soil represents those who hear the Word, but immediately when it comes they shut out the Word. The Word does not even begin to germinate. And as a result take, Satan takes the truth from the heart. And those who have this kind of soil are lost. But we have a second kind of soil. It's the soil on stony ground. Go with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 8 and verse 6. The Gospel of Luke chapter 8 and verse 6. Here we have a description of this kind of soil. It says there the following. Some fell on rock and as soon as it sprang up it withered away because it lacked what? Moisture. Now I want you to visualize that what's happening here there is rock but there's also some good soil because the seed germinates and it begins to grow. Isn't that right? You notice that this seed, this soil is different than the first soil because the first soil even before the seed germinates the devil comes and he takes it from the heart. But here at least the seed begins its process of growth. There is some soil there. But we noticed in Luke chapter 8 that the soil lacks what? It lacks moisture. And by the way it's stony, it's rocky. There's not pure soil, there's also stone with the soil. By the way as we read this in Matthew 13 it gives us an additional detail. Notice Matthew 13 verses 5 and 6. Matthew chapter 13 and verses 5 and 6. It says here, some fell on stony places where they did not have much what? Much earth. And they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But notice, but when the sun was up they were scorched and because they had no root they what? They withered away. Now notice the combination that we have here. We have soil, which is not only soil, but you have rock in the soil. You have soil that does not have moisture. And you have the sun that beats down upon the soil and scorches the seed, scorches the newborn plant. Now you imagine some of you living here in the valley, I, may, I imagine have gardens, what would happen if you plant a seed and it has just a little good soil and it has stone underneath that and so you plant the seed superficially, there's no moisture hardly in the earth and the sun, that Fresno sun, 110 degrees in July, you know about that, is beating down upon the seed. How much of an opportunity does that seed have to germinate and grow and eventually produce fruit? Very, very little. Now what does the seed planted on stony ground represent? Well it represents those individuals who when the gospel is preached to them they are filled with excitement and with emotion. The seed is planted in the heart and they, they say this is wonderful, I've never heard anything like it in my life and they get all enthused. But then trials and tribulations come. 
You see, one of the problems that people have is that they think that when they accept the gospel, it's going to cure all of their problems. They're not going to have temptations or difficulties or tribulations anymore. The fact is, folks, that our greatest tribulations come after our baptism. The greatest tests of the devil come after we've decided to give our hearts to Jesus Christ. I see many of you nodding and saying, yes, that's absolutely true. Because the devil has lost a child. And he's going to make it as difficult as possible to try and gain that child back. But there are people that when the gospel is preached, when we have a series of meetings like this, they're all pumped up and they're really excited and then they have problems with their families, they have problems with their relatives, they have problems at work, they have all sorts of difficulties, perhaps they continue having problems with some of the habits that they had, and they get discouraged. And as a result, they fall by the wayside. By the way, this seed, this soil, represents those who want to serve Jesus and themselves. You see, the stone represents a stone heart. There's a little bit of good soil, which means that they want to serve the Lord, but they also want to keep some of self. These are the ones that Jesus spoke about when he said, No man can serve two masters. You cannot serve the Lord with a divided heart. In other words, it is either everything or nothing. Now, I want you to notice a couple of passages in Scripture that speak about what happens when we receive the gospel of Jesus. Go with me to Mark chapter 10 and verses 28 to 31. Mark chapter 10 and verses 28 to 31. Jesus has just talked about how difficult it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I want you to notice what Jesus continues saying to the disciples because they say we've left it all. What's in it for us? See they were kind of mercenaries. And so Jesus says in Mark 10 beginning at verse 28 the following Mark 10 28 then Peter began to say to him see we have left all and followed you so Jesus answered and said surely I say to you there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the Gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, now notice the next expression, with what? With persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Did you notice that you receive many blessings because you have a new family, a new church family? And so you have everything you need within the church family. But, the, but we find Jesus saying that this will be with what? With persecution. Notice Matthew chapter 10 and beginning with verse 34. The same idea coming through. Matthew chapter 10 verse 34. By the way, it's become very popular today to see on television, television preachers who tell you that when you receive Jesus, you're going to prosper, you're going to get rich, and things are going to go well. That goes totally against the grain of Scripture, and particularly this parable. Notice what we find in Matthew chapter 10 and beginning with verse 34. Jesus says this, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth, I did not come to bring peace but a sword. That sounds strange coming from the lips of Jesus. Isn't he the Prince of Peace? Notice verse 35. For I have come to set a man against his, his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Verse 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You see folks, the second soil represents those individuals who hear the word, they get excited, they think everything is going to be good, everything is going to be prosperity, they have a divided heart, they haven't totally given up on self, they have very little moisture of the Holy Spirit in their lives. They have a stony heart. And then the sun of tribulation shines upon them. And they fall by the wayside. And ultimately are lost. 
You know, several years ago, while I was teaching in our uh, university in Columbia, there was this young lady that came to our theological school. She came to study as a Bible instructor. Her name, Josefina Mendes. She was involved in an accident, and she died a few years ago. But she came to our school, and, uh, you know, I tried to get close to the students and find out about their background. And so one day I was sitting under the trees there and on a bench, and, uh, you know, she came and sat down. We started talking, and she told me her story. She said, Pastor, I, I lived in this town in Colombia. I don't remember the name of the town, but I lived in this town in Colombia. And uh, there I received a handbill in the mail that, that we were going to have uh, this series of meetings. And so um, I decided that I would go to that series of meetings, even though I didn't, I didn't know anything about the church where they were being held. I didn't know anything about the speaker. But uh, opening night, I went to the meetings. And it was an evangelistic series, you can guess. And so she went through the whole evangelistic series, and at the end of the series she decided that she would be baptized. And so she went home, and she told her parents, I've been going to these meetings, and uh, I believe that the truth is being proclaimed there. And they asked her, what church is it? Is it the Catholic church? She said, no, uh, it's the Seventh-day Adventist church. And uh, immediately the parents scowled and frowned. They said, you've been going to the Seventh-day Adventist church? She said, yes, and I've been hearing these wonderful messages, and I believe that it's the truth, and I've made my decision to be baptized. Her father looked at her, and he said, Josefina, if you get baptized, you don't have a father or mother. We will disown you. And Josefina looked at her father and she said, Father, I love you. The Bible says that we're supposed to honor our father and our mother. But I owe my allegiance first to my heavenly father. And therefore I'm going to go through with this. I'm going to be baptized on such and such a day. And her father said, if you're baptized on that day, you're not our daughter. You can't live here anymore. She went to the church. She got baptized. Her parents knew about it because they were checking it out. When Josefina came home, all of her few belongings were on the front doorstep of the house. And her dad met her at the door and he said, Josefina, don't you ever come back here again. And she said, I'm sorry, Father. I love you very much. But I must obey God rather than men. And that includes my own parents. And she came to the school. She didn't have any place to go. And that's why she came and decided to study at the school. She became a Bible worker. She married a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. Amen. And by the way, her parents never accepted the message. As far as I know, she was disowned for the rest of her life. She did not receive the word like the stony ground hearers. I mean, when tribulation came and the family rose against her, she says, my allegiance is with God. But a person who had a superficial religion with very little Holy Spirit, very little moisture, because the moisture represents the Holy Spirit, would have easily fallen by the wayside and have said, oh, what's the use? I can't have my family against me. I can't have my fellow workers against me. I can't have my friends against me. And then fall by the wayside. By the way, did you know that Judas Iscariot fits in this category? I'm not going to read the passage, but in Matthew 8 verses 18 to 22, there's a certain scribe that comes to Jesus and he says to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. That was Judas. And Jesus, trying to discourage him because he knew his heart, says, birds have nests and foxes have holes, but the Son of Man doesn't have any place to lay his head. What Jesus was saying to him is, look, if you're going to follow me for the loaves and the fishes, know that you're going down the wrong road. Because I don't have any prosperity, I don't have money, I don't have anything to offer you in terms of material prosperity. If you're following me for that reason, forget it. Do you know if you look at the context of that passage, you're going to find that Judas offered to follow Jesus when Jesus was popular. Multitudes were following Jesus. I mean, uh, people were excited because Jesus was healing diseases and he was feeding thousands of people. They said, whoa, this is the guy that we want to be with. But then when Jesus started preaching the word, 
according to John chapter 6, only the disciples were left. And Jesus says, are you going to leave too? And Peter says, Lord, if we leave, where can we go? You have miracles. Is that what Peter said? No. You have what? You have words of life. See, Peter, he said many things without thinking. But this was one good thing that he said. He didn't say you have miracles and signs and wonders. He says, you have the words of life. Everybody else left because there were no longer any miracles. But Peter had it straight. And so we have two kinds of soil. Those by the wayside who don't respond at all when the word is preached. They show no religious interest. Second, those on the stony ground, they have a superficial acceptance of the truth. Part rock, part their own self, and part good soil, part Jesus. Trying to serve two masters. Accepting Jesus in a time of emotion and feeling. Tribulations come, they fall by the wayside. But there's a third type of soil. And that is the seed that fell among the thorns. You see that was good soil. But there were thorns. Notice Luke chapter 8 and verse 14. Luke chapter 8 and verse 14 describes this kind of soil. It says there in Luke chapter 8 and verse 14 the following. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who when they have heard, see they hear also, when they have heard, go out and are what? And are choked by what? With cares. By the way, if you go to the Gospel uh, of Mark, chapter 4 and verse 19, it adds an expression. It says, by the cares of this world. It adds that, by the cares of this world. Do you know what the cares of this world are? Wanting to accumulate houses and cars and money and stocks and bonds and wanting to work two jobs. Things that are not bad in themselves but which absorb our time and effort. Those are, that's part of the thorns. The cares of this life. Notice once again uh, Luke chapter 8 and verse 14 it says now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who when they have heard go out and are choked with the cares of this world if you compare Mark what else? actually Mark says with the deceitfulness of riches see that's why you have to compare all three gospels because each one expresses it a little differently. It's not riches, it is the deceitfulness of riches, and then something else. And what? And the pleasures of life. And bring no fruit to maturity. The thorns, by the way, what do thorns represent in Scripture? You remember in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 18, what came in consequence of sin? God said, Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And then what does he say? Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. So thorns and thistles represent sin. Sin comes in. The pleasures of this world, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches come in and they choke the plant which has begun to grow. Now we have biblical examples of this. We have a rich young ruler that came to Jesus. Do you know the Bible says that Jesus loved this young man? He's seen Jesus blessing the children. and He says, I love that man. Look at how the children are drawn to him. And so he comes to Jesus and he says, what do I need to do to have eternal life? Jesus says, well, keep the commandments. He says, which? So then Jesus quotes the last table of the law. And the young man says, I've done all these things since I was a young boy. What more do I lack? And Jesus looks at him and he says, if you would be perfect, 
go sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure with me in heaven and come follow me and the Bible says that this young man left sad sorrowful because he had what? because he had many possessions did he allow the deceitfulness of riches to choke the seed in his heart? you know folks as, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians many times we say oh no I'm not a slave to money I have no problems with money I can handle it and yet what are we doing? we're accumulating things that we're not that we don't really need isn't that right? do we need four houses to live in? do we actually need four automobiles? do we actually need tens of thousand uh, th thousands of dollars in the bank while the work of God is languishing? do you know the time is coming when people are going to cry out why didn't I use my money? why didn't I invest my money in the kingdom of God to further the gospel? why did I accumulate it for myself when we won't be able to buy and sell? people are going to say that but it's going to be too late the deceitfulness of riches has been the ruin of their souls by the way the Apostle Paul had something very interesting to say 1st Timothy chapter 6 verses 9 and 10 1st Timothy chapter 6 verses 9 and 10 the Apostle Paul had something very interesting to say about money and I want you to, re to read it carefully with me because uh, some people misread it they give the impression that riches are bad riches are not bad notice what the Apostle Paul says in 1st Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9 but those who desire to be rich, notice it's not even saying the rich, but those who want to be rich those who desire to be rich fall into temptations and a what? a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition because the more money you have, the more toys you want and the more entertainment you want and the more fun you want now notice verse 10 for money is the root of all kinds of evil ah thank you, thank you for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil or as the King James says is the root of all evil now notice this for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows do you know I have seen many rich people that are absolutely miserable because they're always afraid they're going to lose their riches and they're always thinking about making more and investing more do you know that Jesus gave a parable which describes this type of person? notice Luke chapter 12 Luke chapter 12 and verse 15 Luke chapter 12 and verse 15 folks is it not time for us to invest our treasures in the heavenly bank? do you know how, how you can send your money to heaven now? you don't send it, you don't go to NASA and have NASA send it in a rocket up to heaven what you do is you invest in his cause in the salvation of souls and when the souls end up there your investment is there now notice what we find in Luke once again chapter 12 and beginning at verse 15, 12 verse 15, this is another parable of Jesus and he said to them take heed and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses life does not consist in the abundance of what? of things which we possess and now he's going to illustrate then he spoke a parable to them saying the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully and he thought within himself saying what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops so he said I will do this I will pull down my barns and build greater and there I will store all my crops and my goods and I will say to my soul, soul you have many goods laid up for many years take your ease, eat, 
drink and be merry. Are you catching the connection with the parable of the sower? Verse 20, But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. We find John saying, Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. And I know we pay lip service to this, folks. Do you believe that we're living in the last moments of human history? Listen, as we look at what's happening in the world, I can't help but marvel in the last couple of weeks what we've been seeing. How the United States is fulfilling the prophecy of Revelation 13, the initial stages at least. And how all of the Christians are coming together with a common agenda. We see it. It's so clear. It's patently clear. The question is what are we doing with the resources that God has given us? Are we investing these in the cause of God? You say, well, Pastor Barr, you just want to be paid. Well, let me tell you, the tithe that comes here to this church, you know, we, it, none of it comes into my pocket. It all goes to a central location. And then they pay all of the pastors on an equitable basis. I don't receive any of the offerings that come into the church. The offerings go for the running of this church, for the preaching of the gospel, for evangelistic meetings, for health seminars, for all of these things which have the intent of reaching people with the gospel. And I pray to God that we will lay everything we have on the altar of sacrifice because soon it might be too late. We need to wake up from our slumber. We've been in a coma too long. We've been lukewarm too long. It's time to get up and make a sacrifice for God. As I mentioned in one of the previous lectures, the little old widow, she comes and she throws her two mites in. Jesus says she gave more than all of those who gave great, great sums. And then he explained why. He says because they gave out of their abundance. In other words, they gave what they had left over, what they really didn't need. But she gave all that she had, her only sustenance. And so we have, Jesus said, by the way, in Luke chapter 21, 34, he says, make sure that your heart is not weighed down by carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, that that day come upon you unexpectedly. In Ezekiel chapter 7 verse 19 we're told that in the day when the wrath of God is poured out upon this world people will take their gold and their silver and they will throw their gold and silver in the streets and they will say what good is this? We're lost. We're eternally lost. What good is it to have all of these things? Silver and gold will be absolutely worthless. And so we have three different kinds of people so far that we've studied. Number one, they hear the word, they reject it. Doesn't even begin to germinate. Number two, those individuals who hear the word, and in a moment of emotion they accept that they say, this is wonderful, and then tribulations come, and the sun comes out and beats on the plant, and it dies. Then you have those that are on thorny soil, for whom the deceitfulness of riches, riches, the cares of this life, strangle the seed that has been planted, the plant that has begun to grow. But I thank God that there's one other kind of soil, and that is the good soil. Notice what we find in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8 and verse 15. Luke chapter 8 and verse 15. We find uh, there the following words, Luke 8 and verse 15. But the ones that fail on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, do what? Keep it and bear fruit with what? Patience. Notice that the good soil represents those who hear the Word of God and what? And keep it with what? Patience and eventually it bears what? Fruit. Does the first type of soil bear fruit? No. Does the second type of soil bear fruit? No. Does the third type of soil bear fruit? No, the plant begins to grow but no fruit. 
What is God interested in? God is interested in planting the seed of His Word in our hearts. And that we might receive that seed with fallow soil, with plenty of the moisture of the Holy Spirit. And that that seed germinate and produce a plant which eventually will bear what? Will bear fruit for God's honor and God's glory. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3 we find John speaking about this book which deals with end time events. He says, Blessed is he who reads and what? And those who hear the words of this prophecy and what? And keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Notice, read, hear, that means pay attention, and what? And keep. Notice John chapter 14 and verse 23. John chapter 14 and verse 23. By the way, Jesus abiding in our hearts has a condition. He will not in ab abide in any heart. Notice what we find in John chapter 14 and verse 23. Here Jesus says this, If anyone loves me, he will what? He will keep my word. And my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? If anyone hears my word and what? And keeps my word, both I and the Father will come and we will make our home, our abode with them. James tells us that it's not the hearers of the word which will be justified, but whom? The doers of the word. By the way, do you know that in the end time there are going to be many Christians who hear the word but don't do it? Notice the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. This is a very solemn passage. I'm going to read several verses. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Did you catch that? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Notice it's not only hearing, but what? Doing. It's not only saying, but doing. Verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name? And done many wonders in your name? By the way, were these Christians? Why would they be doing it in the name of Jesus if they weren't Christians? Obviously they're Christians. So what is Jesus going to say? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And then Jesus gives an example. The parable of the man who built his house upon the rock and the man who built his house upon the sand. We even sing about this in Sabbath school. Do you still sing this in Sabbath school? The wise man built his house upon the rock. I remember I used to love to sing that song. Still do. Still am a child at heart. But anyway, Jesus gives a parable of the two builders. Now, who is the one who builds on the rock and who is the one who builds on the sand? Listen up. Verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. Hello? Anybody out there today? Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the what? On the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. What does it mean to be founded on the rock? It means that you hear the words of Jesus, and what? And do them. Now notice what about the man who built on the sand. Verse 26, But everyone who hears these sayings of mine, and does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, 
and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. By the way these verses are speaking about the tribulation that is coming upon the world. Four angels are holding the four winds of strife. When they're released you have the storm, the coming storm. And only those who hear the words of Jesus and do them will be safe in that great day. Now I'd like to take the last few moments that we have to talk about the process of God planting the seed in the soil of our hearts. How does God do it? Well listen to what I'm going to say. The seed is the Word of God. We've already studied that. The Word of God is preached and what that means is that God is taking the seed and He's putting it where? He's planting the seed in the heart. By the way faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? By the Word of God. What happens with people who are not into the Word of God? Who are not studying? Can God plant His seed in our hearts if we're not studying the Word? Absolutely not. Because God speaks to our hearts through the Word. The more we study the Word the more God plants His will and His seed in our hearts. And then He moistens the ground with what? With the dew of His Holy Spirit. And the more time that I spend in the Word, the more the plant grows. And if I continue in this process, eventually what's going to happen is that plant is going to grow to, into a tree and the tree eventually is going to bear what? Is going to bear fruit. And by the way, what is the fruit? Go with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 and I would like to begin reading at verse 19. Uh, well actually let's, let's begin reading at verse 21. Ending about the works of the flesh, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries and the like which I tell you beforehand just as I also told you in time past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Then he speaks about the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Do you know what the fruit of the Spirit is? It's the character of Jesus. Is this a description of the character of Jesus? Let's read it again. It says, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's the fruit. How does the fruit come? Do you have to plant before you harvest uh, uh, fruit? Of course you do. So what does God do? He takes the seed of the truth, He plants it in our heart. The more that we're in the Word, studying the Word, assimilating the Word, God speaks to us, He plants the Word in our hearts through the influence of the Holy Spirit, that plant begins to what? To grow and eventually it produces in our lives the fruit of the Spirit. In other words it produces in our lives the character of Jesus. Do you know we take the mold of the character of that which we dedicate our time to? You know this right? If we dedicate most of our time to music and worldly endeavors and television and videos and all of these things, what type of character are we going to have? we're going to reflect that character. But the more that we allow the Word of God to enter through our eyes by Bible study, by listening to sermons, by watching 3ABN, by watching spiritual things, God plants His seed in our hearts. The seed grows into a plant, then grows into a tree, and then our lives change because we have as a result the fruit of the Spirit appearing in our lives, which is Christ-likeness, the hope of glory incidentally. So we have four soils. Three of them will eventually be lost. One of them only will be saved in the kingdom. What is the soil of your heart? Are you a wayside hearer? Are you a stony ground hearer? Are you a thorny ground hearer? Or are you a good soil hearer? Our decision will determine our eternal destiny. And folks let me finish with a positive note.
Do you know that we're not stuck with the heart that we have? God can change the heart. Just look at Saul of Tarsus. He had a heart of stone. He was right there stoning Stephen, along with, the, not actively, but he was encouraging the people to stone Stephen. And yet the Lord changed his heart from stony soil to wayside, from wayside so soil to a soft, tender heart. The good news is that God can change the soil of our hearts. And I pray to God that we will be like the good soil where the seed of truth is planted unto eternal life.